Ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome along this evening to this public debate on the topic of academic research. Is it of any benefit to the taxpayer? My name is Jason McGilligot, and this event has been organised by the Trinity Long Room Hub, the Arts and Humanities Research Institute here at Trinity College Dublin. This is one of more than two dozen major public events that we've organised for the coming months. And you may be interested to hear, for example, uh, that on the 10th of December from 5.15pm, Dr Ishmael Sarah Gelden, uh, the Librarian of Alexandria, uh, and I think there are a few job titles more romantic than the Librarian of Alexandria, uh, will present a talk on the topic of reinventing Western Islamic relations. On the same evening, at a slightly later time in this building, we have the 7th uh, Glucksmann Memorial Symposium, and three prominent experts will talk to us on the topic of language, culture, and press freedom in Eastern Europe since 1989. Two such high-profile events so closely together will give you a sense of the frenetic pace of activity here within the Trinity Long Room Hub. But you've come here tonight to participate in a public debate on the value or otherwise of academic research. The Irish government has spent more than 860 million euros in support of research in third level institutions over the past decade. And in the midst of a recession which will force many difficult choices upon the country, it has been argued by some commentators that this investment should be scaled back. Others have questioned whether the money spent over the past decade was a poor investment which would have been better spent on building schools and hospitals. This debate will address a number of questions about academic research which will be of great interest, I believe, to the hard-pressed taxpayer. It now looks, as we move towards the end of 2009, like we spent much of the past decade at building overpriced houses to sell to each other. Few would doubt that our future prosperity on this island must be based on something more tangible, more purposeful, and more sustainable. Few would doubt, I believe, that Ireland needs to train world-class scientists. But is state funding the best way to secure this scientific excellence? Is there a tension between the pursuit of pure scientific knowledge and the needs of the economy? And if the rationale for some funding of scientific research seems clear, what is the economic or cultural benefit, indeed, of funding seemingly esoteric research in the arts and the humanities? The three speakers tonight have very different answers uh, to these questions. Uh, and I believe that their short presentations are sure to stimulate a very lively debate. We'll take the three speakers in alphabetical order. The first will be Professor Paul Holm, the Academic Director of the Trinity Long Room Hub. The second will be Dr Declan Jordan, an economist from UCC. And the third will be Professor Luke O'Neill uh, from our very own Department of Biochemistry here in TCD. All three are distinguished scholars and they need no introduction from me. Now that's usually the cue when one is introducing uh, speakers to proceed to give uh, lengthy descriptions uh, of the speaker's accomplishments. And I choose not to do so here tonight, partly because their achievements and distinctions would take an inordinate amount of time uh, to read out, but mostly and much more importantly because I believe and I know that the speakers agree with me that the nature and success of this debate depends not on the speaker's academic qualifications or their distinctions, but on the cogency of their arguments here tonight and on the willingness, much more importantly, of the audience here, you sitting there uh, in the audience, to engage in a frank exchange of views. The speakers will speak for about 10 minutes each and then we'll open the floor, uh, open for the debate to the floor. I would encourage everybody here to feel free uh, to express their point of view, uh, but to express themselves as succinctly uh, as possible, if I may ask you uh, to do that. So without further ado, for me, I'd like to invite uh, the first speaker, Professor Paul Holm, to open the debate. Thank you, Jason. The special group on public service numbers and expenditure programs, the Unboard uh, SNP, led by Mr. Colm McCarthy, published their report this summer. The recommendation for academic research is clear in general, they say. The group is strongly of the view that substantial reductions in funding are warranted given the significant amounts invested to date, the lack of verifiable economic benefits resulting from these investments, 
and the inflationary impact of funding on research and administration salaries, end of quote. And they went on to say that in uh, particular uh, they wanted to decrease the uh, amount of uh, PhD graduates because PhD graduates tend to emigrate. The group proposed total savings of about 255 million euros on public expenses and research, especially by direct cuts uh, in the higher education authority research grants and by cuts in other research budgets in other ministries. So-called staffing efficiencies across the third level sector amounts to a proposed cut of another 140 million euro. In simple terms, this means shifting more academics from research to teaching. Various rationalization measures amounts to another 15 million, and they, on top of this, they propose that the projected cycle five of the program for research in third level institutions be canceled. Overall, they estimate that uh, total staff numbers, including non-academic staff, across the third level sector uh, can be reduced by 10% or about 2,000 people over the medium term. If these recommendations are implemented in the coming budget, academic research in Ireland will suffer a serious blow. We'll know in a couple of days. Money doesn't talk, it swears, as Bob Dylan says. In the land of saints and scholars, the taxpayer may legitimately ask what value she may get from my research. As an Irish taxpayer myself, I prefer to see my taxes spent on building the future of this country rather than on greyhounds and horse racing, which will still get 42 million euro in tax support at the recommendation of Mr. McCarthy. Ireland's current economic situation is so desperate that cuts across the board seem to be called for. So shouldn't research be capped as well? Not if we believe that our future competitiveness depends on a smart economy. Ireland competes in a global marketplace and we need to decide if we want to be the brains or the legs or the hands. The value added of creative and cultural products is at the top end of the scale, while raw materials and basic manufacturing and services are exposed to, to fierce global competition and command low labor costs. The knowledge intensive products in general may command high prices. We want to position Irish products at the top end of consumer interest because that is what will sustain high incomes. In 2002, the European governments agreed on a strategy to make the European Union, quote, the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world, capable of sustainable economic growth with more and better jobs and greater co social cohesion by 2010. To guide themselves, the governments agreed on a target expenditure in research and technological development, R&D, of 3% of GDP, gross domestic product, by 2010, up from 1.9% in 2000. How was this interpreted in Ireland? Well, first, the bar was lowered. Uh, the National R&D Action Plan aims only to reach 2.5% of GDP by 2010, with two-thirds of the increase coming from enterprise. And at a later stage, this was even pushed out to 2013. So where are we now, even before next year's budget? Total R&D spending in Ireland has increased from 1.26% of GDP in 2000 to 1.68% last year. This compares with an OECD average of 2.4%, and it ranks us as number 13 out of the 27 EU countries. We are ahead of Spain and behind the Czechs and the Slovenians. 
We're way behind countries like Sweden, Finland, Germany, Denmark, Austria, which invest 3% or more in research and innovation. In other words, we've just passed the halfway marker, and now we're looking at cutting back from that position. If nothing else, this speaks volumes about the reality of the smart economy. Nice thing if you can get it. We need to put the smart money in the smart economy, but so far we are talking and directing the money elsewhere. So what's the value of arts and humanities research for the taxpayer? The traditional response would probably best be summed up by Robert Graves' famous quotation, there's no money in poetry, but then there's no poetry in money either. And Colin McCarthy may agree with Graves, but I don't. In fact, there's plenty of money in the arts and humanities. Let me just give the crude figures for the cultural and creative sectors in our in 2008, this sector constituted some 170,000 jobs, 8.7% 8 of the total workforce, 7.6% of total Irish GDP. Cultural tourism disperses 2.3 billion euro annually to our local economies. And we can look at the money value of reports on Irish arts and culture uh, in, at an age when Global media are full of negative reporting about Ireland. Uh, the New York media's reportage of Ireland was dominated by cultural st stories to an equi equivalent advertising value of 3.4 million euro in the second quarter of this year alone. Participants at the Irish uh, Global Irish Economic Forum at Farm Lee in September uh, noted that indeed there is a need to recognize, and the quote, the importance of culture in promoting Ireland abroad and developing a unique brand for the country in new markets. Most participants agree that our <coughs> unique and strong cultural identity provides the government and the private sector with a strong competitive advantage abroad, unquote. Research in the arts and humanities directly underpins the creative and cultural industries of Ireland of roughly 8% of the economy. In other countries, these sectors are an even larger proportion. And the UK Technology Strategy Board released a report this July showing that the creative industries are growing at a faster pace than the rest of the economy. It seems to make good sense to invest in a growing industry. Universities may not be good enough in bringing out the potential of the arts and humanities. We need to develop knowledge exchange partnerships between universities and businesses. And perhaps the current funding crisis will help focus our minds on that. But in a knowledge economy, arts and humanities are integral to products and part of the potential. Design, storytelling, and branding come out of the brains of the arts and humanities. Ireland's smart economy depends on graduates exposed to the cleverest and most inventive education possible. Excellence is inspirational. Mediocrity is depressing. And that's certainly true in the academic research. As the saying goes, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Mm. Or as a Dane, I may be, perhaps be forgiven for thinking of King Frederick VI when I read the SNP report recommending cuts in education and research. King Frederick reigned through a singularly unhappy period, a period of national disaster in the early 19th century, <coughs> when the country was officially declared bankrupt in 1813, and the Danish equivalent to Mr. McCarthy proposed to close the National Museum to save money, King Frederick had the good sense to respond, we may be destitute and poor, are we now to be ignorant as well? I hope Mr. Cowan will learn from King Frederick in this case. Thank you.
start by thanking um, uh, Jason for inviting me up to speak here um, and to commend Long Room Pub, um, which having been invited here I looked into and I have to say this is an example of the type of innovation um, that I would very much commend. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great initiative. I also like to thank you for getting me out of Cork um, because uh, I, I managed to get up here and I'm staying overnight because uh, I'm able to have a shower in, in, in Dublin. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, last night uh, and uh, she told me she was travelling to the Caribbean for Christmas. I said, what's the Caribbean got that Cork doesn't have? And she said, uh, is your water back? Um, and I said, no, it's not. Okay, fair enough. Um, let, me, let me clarify my take on the, on the, on the, the motion academic research is it of any value to the taxpayer, um, I cannot, uh, in all conscience, argue that it is of no value to the taxpayer. Of course it's value to the taxpayer. Uh, my issue really, though, is how much value to the taxpayer. Um, more, of, more of a good thing doesn't make it great. Um, and should there be cuts in, in the, in the uh, R&D, the, the public R&D spend? Um, absolutely, yes, there should. Of course there should. Um, and hopefully I'll convince you of that through my 10 minutes or so uh, speaking. Um, one of the, the issues, though, I have in this entire debate is around phrasing. Uh, and the power of words, I saw there one of the, 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 uh, the, the, the events coming up talks about you know, language and culture. Language is really important. And the language in this debate is really important, too. Um, you know, Thing, words are used now as a shorthand for things. Things like the smart economy, things like innovation island. Um, who wouldn't be in favor of a smart economy? I'm certainly not in favor of a dumb economy. Um, I'm certainly not against an innovation island. But I would have a different take on what an innovation island is, and I'd have a different take on what a smart economy is. In fact, it's very difficult to think of a dumb economy um, because I believe that knowledge isn't just scientific breakthrough. The knowledge that matters for innovation isn't just scientific knowledge, isn't just technological knowledge, isn't even just academic knowledge. Uh, I'm with Hayek on this when I say it's knowledge of time and place, that entrepreneurs are the innovators that matter. Innovation is what entrepreneurs do, and they see opportunities in the market which may not require technological breakthrough at all, and that to me uh, is innovation. I mean, let's step back. Uh, and think, why do we want innovation? What is innovation about? What is the smart economy about? Well, the smart economy is about um, enhancing our competitiveness to generate prosperity in the future. It's not an end in itself. Innovation is not an end in itself. We don't innovate for that reason alone. We want to generate um, growth. We want to generate jobs. We want to generate economic activity. So. Um, Will the current policy on innovation achieve those aims? Uh, I'm quite skeptical about that because I think the thinking underpinning it is wrong-headed. I think it's coming from, from a, a, a science push, a techno-fetishist approach. This techno-fetishist approach, credited to Chris Freeman uh, and used recently by Amar Bide, um, who also talks about a techno-nationalism, which I think is also evident in Irish uh, R&D policy, Irish you see, uh, Irish innovation policy, I think it's really Irish science policy, um, this, this idea that the next big idea will be technological. So to challenge this, um, we need to think about exactly what innovation is. I mean, the criticisms of uh, McCarthy, uh, the McCarthy report, and on board Snip Nua, um, really, I think, are, are, are based on the fact that it's short-sighted, that if we cut back now, we're going to lose all the gains that we had in the past. Also, other countries are doing this. Other countries are increasing their spend on R&D, so why shouldn't we? Um, also, uh, this is necessary to attract foreign direct investment, that the multinationals will come and they'll stay if we are a smart economy, if we continue to invest in scientific research. Um, and that if we don't, if we cut back, the alternative is a low-cost economy. But we have this choice. We can either be up the value chain, there's a horrible phrase, or we can be a low-cost um, economy. But what do we mean by innovation? And it's very interesting, I think, that in the smart economy document, innovation is not defined. Um, we throw out the word as if everybody knows what it means, but I'm not sure that everyone shares the same idea of what it means. 
but I would be very confident that it would share the same idea of what it means. Um, and again, coming back to the power of words, I think innovation has been, um, has been hijacked by the science community. Um, innovation is a business phenomenon. It's a business idea. Going back to Schumpeter, right through, through Drucker, uh, and up to, say, MRB Day currently, and, and Krugman. Um, when we talk about innovation, we talk about the market. We talk about a new product or a new process in the market. Uh, by new process, we mean a new way of doing something, opening up a new market, getting a new source of material, and so on. Um, in fact, Schumpeter, in his 1934 uh, definition of innovation, this is the touchstone definition that uh, we use in, 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 in economics and in business literature, said that you know, it's a new method of production, and he said, by no means necessarily technologically new. So he even, he even pointed to that um, back then. So if we think that innovation is a new product introduced, then there is no reason for it necessarily to be a technological breakthrough. Um, and I'd like to, to, to talk through a couple of reasons why I think um, the assumptions underlying the smart economy are, uh, I think, misplaced. I mean, some of those assumptions that I think underlie it are that innovation is science push. That if we invest in research, in a laboratory or in basic research, that will attract the best researchers, that will increase research output, that will then increase spin-offs, licensing, commercialization in our universities, and thereby increase growth in our economy. I think that's the logical sequence um, behind that. Now, I don't have any problem with the fact that an increase in funding for basic science will increase research output. I think we have very good scientists in this country, we have a couple here, right? really good scientists in this country, who if we give them the money, they will produce really good scientific output, if we judge that by publications in nature and publications in science. It's the next part that I, I wonder about, this connection between research output and increases in uh, business activity, increases in innovation, increases in new products and processes. Um, the, 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 the assumption underpinning the smart economy is that uh, smart economy, in inverted commas, as, as the government would, would describe it, is that high-tech se sectors have the greatest potential for our growth. Also, that the government can pick winners. Um, SFI focusing on three particular sectors. Now, the, the reason for that is that you know we're such a small country, we couldn't possibly invest in every sector. So let's focus in on just these three. Now, these three are big sectors in and of themselves, and I don't think even as a small country we can really do credit to the sectors that we're investing in, particularly when those same sectors are the sectors that other countries are investing in. Um, you know, we're not distinguishing ourselves from other countries in, in, this, in the sectors that we, in, which we, in which we are investing in basic science, in basic research. But it comes back to this idea that the government can pick winners. Why do we think that the three sectors are the sectors that will generate growth in the future. Why? Krugman wrote an article, Paul Krugman wrote, wrote an article um, about uh, 10 years ago asking which of the following will be the growth sectors, and he gave three scientific sectors and fast food in, 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 in the UK, which will contribute most to, to US economic activity. Of course, the answer is fast food. We don't know. We don't know what sectors will generate growth in the future. So trying to pick them is like buying a lottery ticket. And you shouldn't buy a lottery ticket, I hope you know that. Actually, it, what you should do is pick your numbers and then don't buy the lottery ticket. That way you'll save yourself the money and you'll get a real thrill. <laughs> just in case your numbers come up. <laughs> so we shouldn't get, get involved in this type of, of, of gambling. What we should be doing is supporting businesses that are innovative from any sector, that from any sector, that can show that they are near market with a product that customers value. And if customers value their products, then they should be supported. If the government should generate this environment conducive to uh, innovation, <coughs> real innovation. I, I use the word real innovation. It's kind of like an in-joke. You don't get it because it's in-joke in my head. Um, when I uh, produced my, my results from my, my PhD, um, I found that two-thirds of businesses did, did R&D. Uh, and I was challenged by uh, someone in the science community to say, well, that's not real R&D. And I said, well, the businesses thought it was. Maybe we'd like to go and tell them that they're not engaged in real R&D. 
this idea that D is really important. D is very important, and D can mean changing the packaging, opening up a new market, taking something from another market that works and not, that isn't in this market and succeeding with it. That's knowledge. That's a smart economy, because that's what entrepreneurs do. Um, this idea that the government can pick winners is based, again, on the idea that the government created the Celtic Tigers. Um, you know, it's amazing when things go well, it's government policy. When things are going badly, it's the global credit crisis. Um, it wasn't us. I mean, governments can't engineer innovation. They can't create uh, innovative businesses. In fact, when we talk about an innovation island, when we talk about an innovation, an innovative country, when we talk about an innovative region, well, we don't really mean an innovative country. Ireland can't innovate. Ireland doesn't exist. It's just an abstract idea. It's just a lump of rock in the middle of the Atlantic. What we mean is businesses in Ireland will innovate. Not that, not that Ireland innovates. It's businesses that innovate. So how do, we, how do we help those businesses to innovate in whatever sector they're in and whatever they choose to do? The idea that other countries are doing it, um, well, yes, they are. And the EU Lisbon Agenda has, uh, has set us the target of 3% of R&D, and, and Paul referred to you know, our spending on R&D. Actually, you know what? Our spending on, on R&D as a percent of GDP is going to increase this year by 8%, even if we do nothing, because GDP has declined by 8%. Now, I don't think that makes us more innovative. So we look at these numbers and say, well, we're not spending as much as somebody else on R&D as a percent of GDP. No, we're not. That doesn't mean we're not as innovative as they are, because that's an input. And doubling the number of PhDs, again, an input. I mean, I have to say that, you know, I, I think I'm a great guy and all, but uh, I don't think with my PhD in economics, I really could get a job anywhere else in Cork, except UCC. I'm not contributing to the smart economy by getting a PhD. So doubling the number of PhDs, I can't see how that improves the chances of us having more innovative businesses. Now, it is a signaling device, and this is one of the suggestions for the smart economy, that it shows our foreign direct investment, it shows our multinational corporations that we're serious, that um, you know, we have committed to the smart economy and we're going to follow through on it. And if we cut back now, all of that will be undone. All of the gains that we've had are, are, will be undone. Now, I have one issue uh, with this as an economist, because all decisions must be made at the margin. We don't worry about sunk costs. It doesn't matter what we spent already. This idea of good money after bad. It's like keeping a, a, a bank afloat uh, when you know it's bankrupt, simply because we put a lot of money into it before. Um, that doesn't work either. Look at Anglo-Irish. Well, currently. Let's, let's, I'll, I'll probably have different examples if you, if you hang on a couple of weeks. But the, the um, idea that we, we invest just because we did in the past is not <coughs> logical. Um, so I have that problem with the invested margin. The opportunity cost of the money that we put in has gone up because we're now borrowing this money. It's not, uh, we have a budget deficit, not a budget surplus. Um, and the, the idea that, um, which I'm trying to talk now, but that other countries are doing it, it has to do with the idea that, well, I teach corporate strategy. Copying everybody else is not a distinctive competitive advantage. If you want a distinctive competitive advantage, what you do is you invest in things that others aren't investing in. A blue ocean strategy um, would suggest that we shouldn't be going anywhere near biotechnology. We shouldn't be going anywhere near nanotechnology because the Americans are doing that already. I mean, you know, the TCD UCD merger has one tenth. They're spending in ten years what MIT will spend in, in one year. But they're going to do ten times better, by the way, with the money that they spend. But anyway, we won't get into that because I, I am against. Um, but the, the, um, what we should really do is look at things that, well, where do we have a competitive advantage? Food, tourism, these are things where we have competitive advantages, where we can be innovative and can come up with innovative solutions. What's wrong with that? Okay, so it's not sexy, it's not cool, it's not scientific, but do you know what? It might create jobs, it might generate, uh, it might generate uh, prosperity. And the last thing I, I, that I want to say is, is that one thing that underpins I think the, the, the um, smart economy is this idea that we can generate, we can identify growth-causing sectors and invest in growth-causing sectors. Um, it completely ignores the users of technology. What really matters for productivity gains 
is not generating new technology, it is using new technology. It is using new technology in businesses. And it doesn't matter where that technology comes from. Um, the, the productivity paradox in, in the States refers to the idea that, you know, um, IT investment is, is, IT productivity is everywhere except in the IT numbers, right? This idea that we're, they're not investing, they're not generating uh, new IT discoveries or information management discoveries, but yet they're still getting productivity gains because they're well able to use them. They have what the MRB Day calls venturesome consumers, enough consumers who are leading um, adopters, early adopters of technologies. And they are sophisticated consumers who bring demands on new technology. They're driving that technology and using it in their own businesses. Uh, B-Day refers to um, a Carter and Williams. Uh, I'd like to give you a quote which I think sums up my thinking on this. This is from 1964, uh, Government Scientific Policy and Growth of the British Economy, in a, in, a, in a journal called the Manchester School. And it says, it is easy to impede growth by excessive research. So this goes further than me. I'm saying, no, we're not going to generate any. They're saying we might actually impede growth. By having too high a percentage of scientific manpower engaged in adding to the stock of knowledge, and too small a percentage engaged in using it. What we need are venturesome consumers. What we need are kids coming out of our schools, coming out of our universities, not necessarily with PhDs, but able to use technology, and able to use technology to solve problems and create value for customers. And that's an image. Okay, thanks. This is the single most important question our country faces. I mean, that's a very serious topic, apart from this joke, to kick things off. Um, we're confronted with a crisis in Ireland, as we all know. The public finances are disastrous. Is it the worst in the world now or something? Definitely, I don't know what the numbers are. But as, as citizens, we have to worry about this. The government have to make cuts for us to survive. And of course, our fear is they'll cut research. And I am a scientist, not an economist. I'm terrified that the progress we've made uh, will go if the government takes us off this particular ball. There's a massive consensus among us scientists this is the case. Now, we have got a vested interest. It always amazes me to be accused of having a vested interest. Of course I have. You know, I'm a scientist. I need funding for my research. Um, I'm extremely mobile. Anyone who's good in science can get a job anywhere in the world. Let me give you one example. Uh, four weeks ago, I was approached by the University of Ghent to be director of a new institute. What was funny about that? <laughs> it's a wonderful city, Ghent. <laughs> Are you from Ghent? <laughs> yeah, I did it. It is here. Oh, right. Um, good beer there as well. So I was, I was approached by the University of Ghent. They made me an offer of uh, 3.5 million euro for my own research. Not my salary, my own research. They were, I was going to be offered a directorship of a 10 lab unit in Ghent. This is the government of Flanders now, the VIB it's called, the biotech sector of the government, still like SFI. 3.5 million for my own research and 20 million for the department. Right. I was up for that. Now, we've never seen that in Ireland, for instance, money going like that from SFI to a department. I'm very lucky, I've had lots of money off SFI. It'd be a better program grant from SFI. The point is, the Flanders government are putting huge amounts of money into research because they really value it. Every government in every developed country funds basic research. So the question for Ireland is, are we a developed country or not? Should we not be also funding basic research? If we're not, we're not a developed country and we're not able to compete with these other countries. It's a pretty obvious thing to say. The other point I would make is the vested interest thing. Um, so I am very proud of Science Foundation Ireland as an Irish scientist. Uh, they've given me probably 10 years of support now. Uh, I've managed to do some good research, I hope. We've had a successful 10 years, as several people have in Ireland. If the Irish government stops funding basic research, I will personally be extremely let down by the government, as all of us will. We've worked extremely hard for this past 10 years, and Colin McCarthy triggered me to write a piece for the Irish Times, because how dare he accuse us, <laughs> effectively, of not delivering. We've worked our asses off for the past 10 years. Now, obviously, we're doing it for science and research. We're not necessarily doing it for Ireland. It's great Ireland benefits. 
But it's disgraceful to think that his one liner in his report said, well, look, there isn't too much evidence that it's doing very much, given the commitment, the effort, the drive, the ambition that we've had, us basic scientists have had. And that's what prompted me to, to write the piece in the, uh, in the Irish Times in response to his, his recommendations. Now, let me go on with six questions. Now, as I am a scientist, we always show slides. I've noticed you already farty types never show slides. <laughs> Uh, six questions. One. <laughs> One, does Ireland want world-class universities? Right. Two, does Ireland want an indigenous high-tech sector? Three, does Ireland want multinationals? Four, does Ireland want to support its brightest and best? This isn't just about economics or money. Number four is, could be the most important point of this evening, right? Do we want to support our people or not, is a question we could ask. Five, does Ireland want science to be an important part of public life? That's a really important one, I think. And in the US, as you'll see a couple of slides on, Obama is putting science central to public life in the US, as you'll see. And we would hope to have that in Ireland as well. Six, does Ireland want a smart economy? I thought a smart was a little car, actually. But we, do we want a smart economy? Now, if the answer to any one of these is yes, you've got to fund basic research, right? You've got to. Without funding fundamental research, we cannot realize these six questions. The universities will not be world class unless crackpots like myself are being supported in my research. Right? It's as simple as that. Uh, indigenous high tech sector, where will that come from? It has to come from somewhere. We can't piggyback on other people's technologies, and that, that never works. I agree with Declan, it's all about turning stuff that's real into sort of products and services, but we have to make the discoveries ourselves and it's be valuable. We can't piggyback. When a company stops investing in research, it survives for three or four years on someone else's research and then falls. Um, multinationals, I'm going to come back to that. That's one that is difficult to call, I guess. Uh, brightest and best we've covered. Public life we'll come back to. And finally, the Taoiseach keeps saying we want a smart economy. He said it last weekend after Maura Gagan Quinn wonderfully was appointed to that post in Brussels. Yet again, Brian Cowan said Ireland's all about the smart economy. There'll be a major egg on his face when we see this budget and there's a cut in science because he's on record for saying he wants a smart economy. Every country agrees to have a smart economy, you must fund basic research. Nobody seems to disagree with that in terms of the amount of money that's going into basic research in other countries. Now, a few more questions. Why is there a strong consensus that basic research should be supported by government? Now, I'm going to start quoting other people, because uh, it's always useful to crib if you're a student. Um, and I just happened to buy Newsweek last week, right, by chance. And there was a, there's an article in there, and it's on the cover, saying America's falling behind Terra finally the rest of the world. So even though America is investing heavily in nanotech and bio, they're falling behind. They're falling behind Europe, actually, looking at various metrics. And Newsweek, this article said, um, it works. Funding for basic research works. It says, uh, government funding of basic research has been remarkably productive. It led to the internet, lasers, GPS, MRI, DNA sequencing, biotechnology. Even when the government was not in the inventor, it's usually the facilitator. The microchip was developed by Texas AM. Uh, that was bought by the US government by the truckload, and that allowed Texas then to develop that product. So even when the government isn't directly funding the research, it supports the companies that are by usually being a, 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 a consumer of that research. The second quote would be, the second reason why there's a consensus, it promotes public-private partnerships. Now this came out of an article I read about a month ago in Business Week, and this is a very interesting article. All the major companies are investing in collaborations with the universities. They can't make the discoveries themselves. Let me give you one example. GSK, a drug company which I've had dealings with, they spend about a billion a year on research and development. They, they, they have very few drugs have come out of that. And they've realized we must interact with the universities to discover these new drugs. Um, and there's some examples in, in this article. Radical collaboration with outside academic partners is becoming an essential research strategy for multinationals. And they give an example of IBM. And amazingly, IBM have six major agreements with the universities in Saudi, Switzerland, China, Ireland, and they mention that Ireland because Ireland was supported by SFI and, and, and there's wonderful research going on in Crown and places. That's where the collaboration is. Taiwan and India, they were the six countries. And there was an interview with several other uh, countries in that article dying for IBM support with their universities. We're on that list because of SFI. Ireland wouldn't be in collaboration with IBM if it wasn't for SFI support. SFI itself, of course, supports the C-sets and clusters. I think it's something like 70 companies are engaged with academics through the SFI cluster mechanism. And then we have multi-million collaborations that I'm aware of with all the drug companies, Merck, GSK, there's one in Trinity, AstraZeneca. So you wouldn't be getting these unless you have outstanding universities doing outstanding basic fundamental research. It's the responsibility of government to fund basic research, not necessarily corporations. That, that's the kind of philosophy that most, most countries would have. 
Now, second, next question. Why is ongoing sustained support for Basie Bridge especially important to us in Ireland? Well, the chief scientist has written a very nice report for the Innovation Committee, and obviously he has a vested interest as well to defend us as scientists, but he makes a very clear, balanced view, and he's very well aware of the cutbacks coming, of course, and he says we must be smart in how we spend this money, and that's how we allocate the money that really counts. He says, for instance, Ireland's commitment began in 2000 and has been delivered to date. There's remarkable returns it, uh, as will be viewed internationally from the investment in research in Ireland so far. Now, there are things, as Declan mentioned, like papers in big journals and so on, they're somewhat intangible, but these are the norms that, uh, by which basic reach is assessed. Ireland's performing extremely well. In other words, we're doing our part. We're delivering on this research investment as scientists. That's, that's the first point he makes. The second thing is we're halfway there. So we do need to keep it going. And of course, it's all about the future. He talks about we want to have a competitive research community, economic objectives, anchoring high tech into Ireland. And very importantly, long-term transformation of Ireland is really the goal of all this. Because remember, it's all about the future. Investment in research isn't about today or tomorrow or even a year or two years. It's about the future. And surely, to goodness, the government should be investing in our future. The second point I would make is, the, a World Bank study came out last year, which Paddy gave me, actually, Paddy Cunningham, the chief scientist, and they say 83% of our country's wealth is in our people. We have no uranium, you know, we have no coal. All we have is our people. Surely the government should be investing in our people. And the analogy I always give is, it's like we've discovered oil, and the government refused to build the oil well. That's how bad it would be. Because all we have is our people. We must invest in our people through these mechanisms I mentioned. The next point is there's plenty of evidence. It's working. Now, the trouble is, once I get into these numbers, economists always slay me. Because you can find out whatever number you like for this. Um, and lots of effort has gone into, in, in various um, efforts among economists, to try to calculate the return from investment in basic research. It ranges from a 10% return, at worst, to a 400-fold return, depending on which study you read. One that I've picked out here, and again, this is from our own research office, so pick on them if the numbers are wrong. Uh, one thing they use internationally is how many spin-out companies do you get from a university per 100 million euro invested? It's used as a metric internationally to see if the investment in a university is giving rise to spin-out companies. And the numbers are very interesting. Cambridge, it's 0.6 per 100 million. Oxford is 2.2. MIT is 2.2. Trinity was 2.7. We have one third the staff in our tech transfer offices that, that these universities have, right? Now again, you can move these numbers around a bit and maybe they're a bit in our favor. If you spread the thing out a bit more, we've less, simply because the investment only began in 2000. If it's over the course of 20 years, we're useless. Even if it's from 2000 to now, it's not great. This is in the last sort of three or four years we get these numbers. This is a huge delivery internationally in terms of level of investment. And remember, those projects that gave rise to the spin-outs are basic research. I'm a founder of a company called Opsona, me and two fellow academics. It's completely built on SFI-funded basic research. We've raised 29 million euro. We employ 20 people with two huge collaborations with multinationals. That wouldn't have happened without SFI funding. So again, if that gets cut, you can forget indigenous biotech starting for, for, for definitely. Now, the next thing is, why, why, would, why are we having the debate at all, if I'm so convinced by it, and many of us academics are convinced by it? Well, it is a question that has to be debated, especially when you're on your uppers, as Ireland is. And there could be other uses put to this pot of money. And I know that someone would favour getting things closer to market and investing in, in later stage innovation, because that may give a quicker return. And I can understand that argument. But the, the reason why we wonder is about this, it's expensive, it is costly, so to run my lab is about 1.3 million a year, for instance. Now, we do employ 20 people. Uh, Two-thirds goes back to the exchequer through taxation and spending the money in the economy, however. But it is expensive compared to other things. And the payback is hard to quantify. That's the truth. There's a 10 to 15-year time frame from when you fund in basic research to, 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 to you get a return. The best example that's been done on this is biomedical research. The Wellcome Trust, who are a charity, put billions into research. They wondered, are we getting a return? I think their report showed a 60% return after 10 years, and every year after that 60%. So it's a long lead in, and then the returns begin to come. So for a government, it's tricky. These are short term policies you often see governments have. This has to be a long game to look for this economic, this sort of economic return that gets quantified. The second reason this question is it is a crapshoot. There's no two ways about it. Funding basic research is very difficult to predict. You cannot predict where the next breakthroughs are going to come from, and that worries people. They want to see investment and return. Funding basic research is extremely uh, difficult to predict its success. 
and it needs efforts of hundreds of people, high IQs, PhDs, deep curiosity, a strong work ethic, and serendipity is the key one. So it's, it's a risk, that's the trouble with this. And that's why people question as to whether we should be funding it or not, and I'm very well aware of those issues in the debate. And it's hard to answer them in truth. Now, let me finish with a couple of things. Why we must continue to support science. And again, I'm going to quote from a couple of things. I read, I read reading the Financial Times three weeks ago, and there were two striking articles in the Financial Times about this topic. Barossa is on record. Europe is going to have its first chief scientific advisor. And this, this is the first time ever. And this, and it's not more again, Quinn, I hasten to add. But <laughs> this person will have the power to deliver proactive scientific advice through all stages of policy development and delivery. Okay. That's a very important statement, that. In other words, science will be used now robustly. There's my phone. That's the minister for the... So now, um, the, the second uh, quote was Barack Obama, in response to the global meltdown, now this is the point that can make substantial increases. Every, everyone else is increasing their investment. So you might say, well, should we, should we not? Um, including in the US, Australia, and Germany. And the, the, the thing relates to Barossa here, he's issued a directive to all federal departments to guarantee scientific integrity throughout their operations, transparency in the use of data, the best scientists are going to be involved in giving advice. This is every federal department now in the US. Uh, whistleblower protection for officials who speak out about the suppression or alteration of scientific data. In other words, governments are constantly misusing scientific data for their own advantage. Don't quote me on that, it does happen. Um, Barack's trying to say, look, we're going to put proper science behind this. We want robust data. In other words, science will permeate public life. If you don't have funding for basic research, you won't train the scientists to go into public life. It's another reason why we need science funding, and the arts and humanities as well, of course, but for somewhat the same reason. And again, it's all about supporting our brightest and best uh, in the context of this sort of public aspect of where science has a role. Now, here's the question, what might happen in Ireland if the, if the funding is cut? And again, I'm quoting from people here, and this is in the Irish <laughs> Times. Dick Olstrom said, a cut of 100 million euro, which is threatened, right, at the moment, in the research budget is being considered by the government, if implemented, hundreds of millions of euro in foreign direct, in direct investment is in jeopardy, Dick Alstrom says. Right? Frank Gannon, even more worryingly, our very own director, a very important person for us, because he's the director of SFI, he is in the Irish Times on record to even pause on research investment will have irreversible negative effects. Irreversible negative effects, this is a pause. Right? Very worrying when the director general says that kind of thing. And then finally, and probably most worryingly if you're an economist, uh, Jim O'Hara, the general manager of Intel Ireland, has said, unless there is an internationally recognized commitment to and reputation for research and innovation, Ireland will not be considered competitive. Now, what does he mean by that? <clears throat> we will not be considered competitive. It means they leave. <laughs> it means other multinationals won't come here. That's how serious it is if the eye is taken off the ball. There's a real risk. Now, we can't prove they leave. He isn't on record as saying that. I'm putting words in his mouth there. But in other words, the word has got out that Ireland's great for research because of SFI. It's a reason why multinationals want to come here, especially in biotech, actually. So there's an amazing number of biotechs in Ireland doing great work for, great, uh, for our economy. It's because we have this reputation in scientific research. That's another reason why they want to come here, I guess, is the way to put it. It gives us an edge over some of the competition. Other countries will offer tax breaks. Others will have um, you know, good education systems, I guess. This SFI business gives the IDA an edge. And they're on record as saying that as well. And all these people could be lying, of course, and they are all vested interests. But there's such a consensus among them all that if the cut comes, the damage could be irreversible and very damaging. And the question is, is that what the T-shirt wants? Well, is it? You know. And I would hope not. And I hope the T-shirt is here tonight, <laughs> listening to this. Because the fear really exists that if the eye is taken off the ball on this one, we're in big trouble. And that's why I think it's one of the key questions that the government must now face in terms of funding and basic research. And thank you very much. Well, three very different uh, approaches to the uh, pressing problems facing uh, Ireland and uh, the Irish economy uh, at the moment. I'm going to open up the uh, discussion to the floor now to both uh, techno-fetishists and techno-phobes uh, in the audience. Uh, we will finish for half seven, uh, and before we finish at half seven, uh, I'm going to ask the speakers perhaps to come back and sum up for perhaps 
uh, two or three minutes uh, on the, uh, the discussion. Uh, before I open it up, I, I do want to stress that uh, people are welcome to ask individual uh, points of the, of the speakers, but perhaps it may be more uh, productive to open a debate among the audience, uh, among the gen audience in general, about the points that have been raised. When I do uh, call on people to speak, it would be helpful uh, if people could identify themselves. Uh, you are welcome to uh, ask a question or make a short point, but if you do need to make uh, a longer point, please try to make it uh, as uh, succinctly as possible. And as far as is practical, though, uh, I'll try to take as many points from the floor uh, as possible. So I prefer not to take repeated points from any one individual, uh, so long as there are people in the audience uh, who wish to speak who haven't uh, already spoken. Uh, spoken. Uh, and so uh, I welcome comments. Uh, questions, contributions from the floor? Yes. Since everybody is so shy, uh, Bill Grimson, uh, Dublin Institute of Technology. I think the argument um, that it's about choosing your risks and playing a game is probably fair enough. And I would put it to the panel that it probably is as good a risk to bet on science as it is on nano. And certainly a lot cheaper. Do they view it that way, I wonder? <laughs> In government. Because obviously the pot of money is constrained, so I wonder if they view it. I'm definitely somebody that, that Bernie Hearn would have a uh, gardening <coughs> and growing food out of at least comment. Uh, you know, if you heard that, just, instead of Instead of uh, the winters of mourners committing suicide, he said that this week that they should be out doing something useful like gardening or growing bluebells. Um, I think NAM is a terrible travesty, it's an awful idea. So I'm kind of against everything, really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a choice between NAM and scientific research. At least I hope not. That's, a, that's an awful job. Well, if I may say, I for. I mean, I know the government have this wonderful thing about the money that goes into man is off the books and doesn't count. I don't buy that argument. No, no. I think we have to pay for it one way or the other. Um, I use NAM as, a, as simply a, 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 as an example of we, we have a choice to make as a society. And in this particular case, it appears to be we've made a choice to our government, to the, the, the politicians, to put a lot of money into banks and NAM. And we are now looking down the barrel of putting <coughs> proportionally less money, which is actually a fraction of what's going into the banks, into science. And it seems to me on the balance of, of, of an investment in terms of risks, we're making the wrong call. <coughs> and if it's not now, it could be something else I could I could I could bring into the argument. I'm not saying that science is going to be deliver everything all at once or even, even in ten years, but in terms of investing in money, it seems a better return. Um, some of the things we're investing on. I think, are there any, any calculations? You know, so, so, as I said, in my lab, 20 staff, probably two thirds, so two thirds of the money I get from the government is in salary. So, I guess the question is, who should they pay in the public service in a way? You know, would you, would you pay a scientist? Or, in other words, it, it can get a bit divisive in that sense, but would you pay a scientist? Or would you pay a banker? Or would you pay, who, who's going to be the best for the economy, I suppose, as, 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 a, as a unit to, to pay, right? And if you're paying scientists, you, you're going to get the money back through tax anyway, and through their, their, uh, their they, they'll be a, an economic unit in the economy. And then maybe what they, one of those people might give rise to a huge benefit to the Irish economy <coughs> them, through one of their discoveries. So I think that's another way to, to look at this investment in science. It's about people, and much of it goes back anywhere. I don't buy the, the dilemma that's been presented, though. I mean, this idea that you know it's NAMA, or I know you're using it as an example. I mean, if I was spending this money, I would much rather spend it on having proper schools at primary level and at secondary level, at funding uh, university teaching, rather than having large lecture halls like this, with a junior lecturer teaching a large lecture hall like this. I would invest it in, in um, uh, IT, uh, broadband, in the community, so we generate these ventures and consumers. Uh, it, you know, we put it into basic science, or into research, I, that's, I think that's too late. If we do want a vibrant science community, we do want, you know, a strong IT uh, investment. Let's let's get kids working on enterprise. Let's get them, you know, entrepreneurial. Rather, you know, we have one PC for every nine children in primary level. We've one for every seven in secondary level. Uh, most of those are over six years old. I mean, I know when when I'm talking to first year students, they find it difficult to do things in Excel, in PowerPoint, in Word, 
okay, they're great at playing video games, but they can't actually do the business applications. That's what we should put our money into if we want to get a smart economy. That's a smart economy. But surely you need, again, the either or, the video is there, there can be, you need that as well. No, I think if you want a smart economy, that's what you invest in. What's the point but of investing in primary schools if that, that child can't eventually participate fully in the university later in life by getting into high level research or perhaps doing a PhD? Will they emigrate then? <laughs> because we'll have all have emigrated by then. So, so what will happen to that, that primary school student when it turns out to be a scientific wizard? And then there's nowhere to go to do a PhD. Can I perhaps open those questions up to the yeah, floor yeah, then and, 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 and perhaps see what people uh, <laughs> think in terms of broadening it out? I, I, they, they, it's interesting that the first question raises the question of, of NAM. I don't know about you, but it, NAM is a, is a four letter word which makes me blush. Uh, so you know, and, and I just I just wonder is is, there, is is that really what people think is is the choice that we, they, does that seem a, a convincing argument that we should bet because it's slightly better perhaps in a return than than now? Sorry. No, I try to make yes. the whole thing and now I don't think it is because I think we should spread the money around. I know we don't have the reason to pull this money, which is the case, but I think. The idea that putting it all into technology, it just doesn't, that 83% doesn't represent all the people. 10% of people less even go on to do PhDs. I mean, the intellectual capital in this country is far beyond science. And I, it's a pity that if it does get a cut, it would be humanities and arts and other cultural, and science, other cultural disciplines that will put a lot into the economy, but I think there's far more <coughs> Concentrating on at the moment, tourism, like um, was said there before, creating uh, employment in indigenous economies, amalgamating the environment with social and economic and poverty type issues is the way we should be working towards. And I think the only way doing that is by bringing everyone together. I mean, it's not going to happen with a smart economy. It's not. It's not going to spread around. <coughs> I suppose, like, um, so you tell us just in the one um, but I, I suppose something that kind of concerns me with the, um, your kind of proposal, which is, you know, to give it to enterprise and businesses and to create, like, was it ravenous consumers or? Venturesome. Venturesome. Ravenous consumers. Ravenous consumers would be even better. Yeah. Um, to me, it sounded a lot like, you know, a return to, like, a shutdown Ireland, you know, of the 80s, where, you know, that we aren't anymore outwardly looking, that we aren't anymore um, internationally facing. And if you walk around TCP, like, to me, one of the big advantages is that it's an international community, that, that because it's a university that is number 43 in the world or whatever, that... Oh, yeah, um, I have to bring that up. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, you do have to bring that up because that is what attracts... the UCD? <laughs> and, yeah, because that is what attracts, you know, world-class intellectuals. And it is actually the meeting of minds that actually brings um, uh, commercially viable ventures. And, you know, so if Ireland shuts all that down, then it will be a return to the 80s where... Not like in a sense, in the last ten years, what we've had is an economic environment which attracts international people. Not only retains Irish talent, but actually attracts a, a, a second layer of you know, so that people are stimulating each other. And it sounds to me that what you're proposing is actually let's get rid of that layer of the international thing, get rid of any Irish with ambition, and let's go back to a marketplace economy. And that actually isn't going to sustain the venturesome, ravenous consumer is not going to sustain anyone. So I think it's kind of a dangerous approach to take to what is obviously an a economic crisis. But, you know, I was here in the 80s, and uh, that was also a really horrible time to live through, you know, to watch everyone leave. And um, so I'm not sure that that's the solution I would propose. <coughs> Did you want to come back briefly? Yeah, I, I don't know what I said. And I don't, what's the, what I said, what you heard was what I said, I hope. Um, I don't want to go back to the 80s. I was here in the 80s too, and I, I'm not talking about that. In fact, I think, if anything, the idea that we need to generate all our knowledge in Ireland, to, you know, we need to invest in Irish universities to generate knowledge for Irish businesses is insular. That's not international. Um, okay, we can attract 
uh, uh, star superstar scientists from abroad and come in, and, and that's great. We generate this this uh, um, melting pot or something, you know, what you describe as this meeting of minds, which is which is fantastic. But but I don't think that um, what I was saying was that we would be less international. In fact, we'd be more international. What we would have to do is we would have to look for the new technological breakthroughs, and we would be um, seeking out. Uh, things that work in other markets, trying to apply them here. We would have to look at other markets and sell our goods <coughs> elsewhere, and sell what we're good at. Things like food, things like tourism, these are outward looking, these are export uh, products. Well, I think their food and tourism are inward looking, they're ways of bringing people here. And Enterprise Ireland and, and Invest in I have been living in that sort of environment, and that's like their only job is to try and, and create businesses that have exportable goods. And, and the reality is, you know, if you talk about actually what we have been successful at is creating world class universities, what we haven't been successful at is creating exportable goods. And where they, where the, where the, <coughs> those Invest in I and Enterprise Ireland, where they do work. Is with the universities. That's. I mean, why, I'm sure they come you, to you. Why do you want more universities? Well, it, perhaps I might throw that question out uh, to the audience. It, this it, thing's turned around. We want more. Why do you want more We want one more university. Where should our bright kids go? Abroad, be educated. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to. I'm, Back to the 80s. Back to the 80s. I'm, can I just uh, in, in, interrupt there, just to to kind of bring some sort of focus to it? It seems to me there's there's, there's an element of cross talking across purposes here. There's a danger, and I think perhaps we might focus the, the, the discussion of, of talking about there's a scientific community, there's a business community, and then there's an arts and humanities community, and everybody talks within their own little community and says, well, the other guys uh, are the problem. So I wonder, you know, are, are there people, I'm sure there are quite a few people here from the uh, academic community uh, within Trinity, but I really would encourage people from uh, a business uh, background who, who may be here to, to, uh, to speak up. I have a number of indications from the floor, but before I uh, take them, I'll just ask Paul Holm to come back. He wanted to talk. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think the, the, the problem here is that really both of you uh, are addressing this from a very sectoral point of view. You obviously, Luke is making the point that you cannot do without science. Obviously true. Uh, Declan is making the point that there, there are plenty of other business opportunities out there and science will not always deliver. And of course, that's very true. We, we need to invest in all the jobs that are are needed in, in, in Ireland. The problem is that, that we are currently faced with a challenge from well, a McCarthy report, which is totally devoid of any sense of direction. It cuts across the board, uh, and the, 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 one of the, the, the targets that you point at, <coughs> the increase in, in the potential of increasing the economy of tourism, is actually one of the most viciously targeted in the, in the McCarthy report. Uh, they propose a whopping 21% cut uh, in the Ministry of Arts, Sports and Tourism. So we're not looking at really uh, a political debate which is sort of between that option and that option. We are looking at a political debate which is simply just devoid of any sense of direction at all, which is, I think, the, the most devastating news uh, at all. Last year, that the politicians seem to have, seem to have lost any sense of direction. Um, I think the, the arts and humanities clearly is 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 also threatened in, in this process. We will just be cut as part of, of the generic, the, the basic cuts uh, that nobody is really targeting, especially the arts and humanities at the moment. The arts council managed to sort of counter the, the arguments coming out of, 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 of the, the, the early debate of the council report and actually, uh, I think, presented a very convincing case for, for their survival and I'll be very surprised if, if, if we see very big cuts in, in their budget. But if you look at, at all the, the softer issues, they're really up for grabs in, in this report. For instance, the, the Irish Council for Bioethics it's a paltry 0.4 million euro that goes into that. That's abolished by, by the McCarthy report. 
uh, initiatives such as the environmental awareness program, the climate change awareness campaign, will be cancelled. That sort of is indicative of where this report is leading us. We, we have lost any sense of direction, we have lost our sense of what are the big global issues confronting us, and certainly there's no sense of inspiration coming to us. <coughs> Uh, I have two indications there. First, uh, the woman at the back. Uh, hi, Lee Brennan from Trinity College Library. You know, we wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for a series of disastrous policy-making decisions that were based on lack of basic evidence and facts. And I think that Luke referred to this desperate need that we have for evidence-based policy-making and for some facts. And an end to ignorance and the blind belief in the next great thing that will come along and solve our ills starting with on board SNP Mua, who, um, as I'm sure you know, used the wrong patents database upon which to base their allegations that we weren't uh, delivering, that they used, simply used the Irish patents database. They should have gone to their library and done a refresher course on basic research methodology. <laughs> uh, the gentleman in the middle. <coughs> yeah, uh, the, the whole... <coughs> The focus of the debate seems to be on a different level. If we consider the fact that one corporation alone, Exxon Mobil, made a profit of 400 billion, 40 billion dollars last year, that's just one. That's surplus income. We could ask them to give us one tenth of their profit, and we wouldn't have to be making cuts. There are many, many more corporations with that kind of wealth to spare. Yes, I have uh, the woman at the back there. Um, I get the impression I'm one of the few non-academics here. I have a basic science degree and I have a master's in business, so I straddle both areas. I came tonight because I struggle in my own workplace with the tension <coughs> between research and between doing the job, and I was trying to solve that debate. And also with what I perceive as qualification inflation in the healthcare industry and whether that benefits the consumer who is the patient, whether having a physiotherapist who has a PhD is better than having a physiotherapist who has a bachelor's in science. They're more expensive. Does it really benefit, benefit the consumer to have, and is all creativity and innovation, does it have to be channeled through academia? I personally don't think so. And I think it's an expensive route, and in fact often suppresses creativity. That's a dangerous thing to say in this room. That would be my observation. So there's just some of my struggles. No, thank you very much for that point. Uh, there was somebody else who had the gentleman in the front. Isn't that the government has no choice but to cut? It's been kept afloat by the EU, by the ECB, and uh, we've made an agreement with them the last week. But you will have to do something very drastic next week. And the focus this week, as we speak, I, I don't know what's going on in the pay talks. But there is a feeling that, say, our pay levels in the public sector are, by international comparisons, fairly high, also in the academic area. Would the academic research community be willing to accept a pay cut of 20% on condition that the Science Foundation Ireland non-pay budget was untouched? <laughs> I could answer that if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to pay increase, actually. <laughs> uh, it would be interesting if we could have uh, binding votes here on the rest of, uh, of academia and Irish society, but alas, uh, unfortunately, we don't. The gentleman. Do you want to make a couple of points? Uh, my name is James Cohen. I'm not an academic uh, moment in the tech transfer side. Uh, just wanted to throw in a couple of points. Um, you're talking about smart economy. The really question is how smart you actually want it to be. Now, to you say a football analogy, you want to take out Real Madrid or Man United that can beat the best teams in the world, or are paying Shamrock Rovers or Cork City money. And you can't do it on that basis. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, and the, again, the, the, the gentleman mentioned there how much companies spend on R&D. Uh, I think in the last five years, Ireland spent 800 million on research in universities. Toyota spent 10 billion dollars a year. So again, we're, we're spending Shamrock Rovers money and we want Man United. The um, in terms of the, the, the creative arts, you know, that, that, that type of um, 
could, could raise well. Uh, one of the, the examples that Professor Neil used on this slide was Cambridge. Now, Cambridge is looked on as being a really good example of, you know, spin off companies, Silicon Fed, you're looking at the, at the UK's equivalent of Silicon Valley. The biggest contribution that Cambridge has made to the UK economy is not to do with technology, and it comes from the footlights, you know, the amateur uh, dramatic society that produced the, the Monty Python team, John Clays, all of those. You want to borrow that money and the, the, the amount of money that the, the companies made you know, from, from spin-outs, from university research, it's just lost in the noise. You know, so that if you don't have the university start to pull in these people, okay, the, you know, the carriage challenge is, is different, but there is a huge contribution to be made by, by the arts and the humanities side as well. There was somebody else who uh, indicated, the gentleman at the back. Um, one of the things that I'm struck by, talking about innovation, when I came to study for my PhD here in Ireland, I was really struck by the fact that people, when they attended third level, tended to stick within their cognate discipline. I came from a liberal arts background, and when I did my degree, um, I had to take science, I had to take English, I had to take history, I had to take some art, I had to take some athletics. It was a liberal arts base, and it gave me an idea, it gave me sort of a cross-pollinated academic experience. And one of the things that struck me here when I was doing my PhD, and I was um, demonstrating as a postgraduate student was the sort of academic, um, I don't want to say apartheid, but the real separation between the arts, humanities, the sciences, <coughs> that there wasn't that level of cross pollinization going on. And I, I take um, the gentleman from Cork's point that I, I've been here for about 15 years, and if we are going to create a knowledge economy, it has to start with. The, gener the, the younger generation. And the money just is not in the primary and secondary infrastructure to do that. I take the point that we need to develop um, research at, at the third and fourth level as well, that we have to have those sectors there for our students. But I think it, there has to be a long-term approach to this and also a real, really serious look at the way academic structures in this country um, are manifested because I do think that what's interesting, one of the things that really struck me was that in 1985, the biggest export out, out of Ireland was the Joshua Tree. It was an album made by four individuals that barely went to college and yet used you know, the technology of you know, um, guitars and electronic um, technology in a very innovative way. So, and, and also that, speaks to the cultural and musical sector and, and, and the sectors uh, related to tourism and sector, the cultural sectors. They're so, not paying any tax here though. Well, they're not paying any tax here now, but if you, the point that I guess I'm trying to make is that the innovative ability, the entrepreneurial ability is there, but are the structures there to be able to harness that? Um, and I do think, I mean, we're talking about this next, bu the budget next week, that regardless of what the government drops or takes away on our lap, is it as academics and as people in the business world, we have to start taking a long view of things. That the structures we build now aren't for necessarily ourselves, or the salary that I'll make make as a uh, you know as a, as a PhD or as a professor, but what my child is going to do. And I think that's the only way really to proceed with this when you're given such an apocalyptic um, vision of a budget. Is it really, I mean, as Obama says, you know, you don't want to ruin a good, good crisis, you know. So. We have about five minutes before I would have to ask the speakers to come back. So I'd, I'd uh, encourage anybody who hasn't uh, asked a question or made a point uh, so far to, uh, to do so. It, it does strike me, the last speaker and a number of speakers have talked about the, the, the value of, of uh, the arts and the humanities and, and when people say that, and, and I should declare a, an interest having a PhD in the, in the arts and humanities, I always think back to the scene in Groundhog Day in which Andy MacDowell said that she, she you know, loves 19th century French romantic poetry at which her, the, the leading man uh, splurts into his coffee and he can't, can't believe and, 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 and laughs himself silly at the idea that somebody would do this. And, and, and really, are we, are we talking about two different cultures here? Are we talking about the idea that business and science are, are acceptable? Or, 
is there a way that we can we can we can meld uh, those together? Is it really do people think useful in the current climate to be funding arts and humanities PhDs? Do we need in a difficult situation like this to prioritise and say that actually science is much more important than arts and humanities uh, in in the short term when we have no money? Where do the cuts come? <coughs> Sorry, the gentleman at the back. Yes. Yeah, um, Harry Cullen is the School of Social um, and Social Policy. Just one observation in relation to the debate that this debate and other debates are going on. I just wonder has our current government succeeded in pitching di different interests against each other? And whether or not the academic community has some kind of role into trying to oppose that in a much more coherent, collaborative manner in, and contributing to potentially to much more kind of, you know, intellectually informed debate in the future, rather than just carrying its own vested interest. And the point is well made. It does seem very <laughs> similar to a, a debate on the environment in which every section uh, of the economy says, for example, Ryanair says, well, air travel is only 2% of, of uh, uh, global pollution, therefore it's not very important, or other sectors say, well, we're only 1% and so on. It does seem like a, like a policy over the last year or so has been very... Uh, very fragmented and very segmented, so I think the point is, is very well made. Yes, the gentleman. Uh, Michael Kelly, um, HEA. Very interesting debate, very, very uh, polarised debate. I, I come from um, the school of thought that, that puts um, innovation and uh, it's a mindset, it's a way of thinking. It's not actually necessarily about PhDs. But around the question of where does um, the strategy we follow, for example, in relation to growing the cohort of PhDs right across the board, science, engineering, technology, arts, humanities, social sciences, right across the board, where does it fit in? I think it fits in with uh, building the capability in our society to deal with the challenges of the future. Some of those are economic, <coughs> some of them are business related, some of them are social, some of them now are multicultural. That's what we're doing. We need, though, to build the innovative mindset from the beginning of a child's education. And that's a huge challenge for the entire higher education system, because we're not doing that. The teachers we're producing are not doing that. The curriculum we're teaching is not doing that. That is actually the big challenge. But the question, it's not necessarily that uh, investing in public PhDs will guarantee economic prosperity, but can anybody in the room point out to me a country in the world that is prosperous and is on a growth path and is progressive that doesn't have a, a certain level of research workers in its workplace? that is not investing in research <coughs> and development and innovation. Because if there is such a country, I'd love to study it, and I'd love to emulate it. We take the point. We have time for one very quick question before I'm really just forced to, uh, to, to bring the speakers back in for, for closing comments and the gentleman in the centre. <coughs> My name is uh, Jeremy Lewis, Trinity College. Um, I think the points that, that have been made uh, in terms of what the balance of uh, allocation of resources between arts, humanities, business and, and the sciences is, is quite important and it seems to me that in over the last 10 years the balance has tended to uh, lay much more heavily on, on the development of science and uh, technology uh, areas and they're not the only areas I think as Declan pointed out where uh, innovation takes place. Now it's very striking when you look at where people are actually employed with these different kinds of qualifications in Ireland is that um, most of the science and technology people are employed either in the universities or in the public sector. There's very, very little employment of people with higher level qualifications um, outside of those sectors. So my question for people who argue for more and more funding for the, for the science areas is where are the jobs going to come? 
thank you all for that uh, discussion. I think it was a very useful uh, discussion, a very timely discussion. Uh, it is uh, striking, I think, that tonight at half ten uh, there is a, a debate on this very topic uh, on RTE on prime time tonight, and I think it's, it, it really is a, a debate that has to be had, and uh, for those coming from an academic background, would, many of them would feel has to be won uh, at the moment in the, in the current economic uh, circumstances. Uh, but before we finish, I'd like to ask the speakers, just from where they are perhaps, uh, for, for their uh, closing thoughts in the order that they uh, spoke uh, originally. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think underneath the, the, the differences of opinion that we've heard now, I think actually we, we are in agreement basically that all the great <coughs> challenges of such uh, have both a technical and a technical but certainly not heard anyone argue that we want to go back to a dying economy. So a lot of what we've <coughs> been arguing about obviously is to do with the understanding of words. Uh, what it's not, uh, where, where we do differ, is when we look at the actual recommendations for cuts. Uh, and the cuts really go beyond words. As I said, or Bob Dylan said, uh, money doesn't talk, it swears. And I, I do think that this uh, proposed budget uh, swears, uh, certainly, to my ears, uh, we need to come up with better solutions for the future. Uh, Ireland cannot survive as a country with politics that is totally devoid of any sense of direction. Uh, Ireland has too in intelligent a population as well. We will not suffer that. Uh, and people are already reacting, I think. We have had a full year of really depressing uh, talk to us all about how we've suddenly the, uh, the carpet uh, has been uh, moved from uh, under our feet. We've all been tumbling and we've also had the sense that all the lights have gone out. Uh, so where are we? Totally, total disorientation. I think we are beyond that. This budget will actually help refocus people's minds. There will be a coming to our senses in the uh, in the sense that we need to come up with concrete proposals for where we want to be headed. Uh, that'll be very helpful. It will be a challenge to all three of us because we will then be forced to not just react negatively uh, to a hopeless uh, budget proposal, but actually come up with some weighted preferences. I think we are all in agreement that education is the absolute fundamental uh, principle that we need to build on. There is nothing on this island if we do not have education. And educational quality needs to be at the top. We need to innovate ourselves. We need social innovation more than technical innovation. We need to be able to interact better, better we need to see the opportunities and we need to break down the institutional barriers that too often block even sensible uh, solutions in the short term. That means we need to focus also on user-led innovation. We know that most of the, the, the major business breakthroughs and certainly the, the, the ways in which businesses really generate uh, high sustained growth is if they are able to listen to their customers. At the moment, Ireland Inc., the politicians are not able to listen to their customers, but also if we want to develop uh, sustainable Irish businesses, we need to develop our very ability to listen to our customers in Ireland and abroad. And in order to do that, we need to have that basic understanding that we need both a human technical understanding. And that's where the arts, the humanities, and the sciences actually come together. We need to have that merger. We need to talk across that <coughs> big divide, uh, which has been conjured up again in this debate. I resent it. I don't think it's helpful. Uh, we cannot move forward if we have a, a debate which is based on, on those uh, divides. 
And therefore, obviously, we cannot move forward if we have a budget which, at the end of the day, simply tells us we will put out all the lights in the room and see where we go from here. We need to have a sense of direction. Uh, we can certainly request that from the politicians. As far as the Trinity Long Room Hub goes, and here speaking as one of the co-organizers of this debate, at least we need to, to take on the respons responsibility to raise the voice of the humanities in this debate. That's what we've tried to, tonight. We invited uh, you, and thank you for coming. Uh, but we really need to be able to raise the voices in a responsible manner, saying, yes, we all need to contribute. So we started with this. Thank you. Declan, could I ask for your final comments? Yeah. Um, I, 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 the sense is that there's a polar, um, uh, that there's a polar debate going on here that uh, somehow it's the scientists against the business people in the arts and humanities. To be honest, I, I really don't have any uh, um, axe to grind with the science community. I think we have a fine science community. And uh, I, some of my best friends are scientists. Um, I mean, no, I think, I think they are delivering. They are absolutely delivering on what they are requested to deliver. That is, when they're funded, they produce the scientific outputs that they are required to produce. But, and this is where, uh, as an economist, I have an issue, is why? Why are we funding them? We are not funding the sciences or arts and humanities in order to generate scientific output, to generate PhDs, to generate um, uh, publications, bibliometric indicators. That's not what we want. What we want are jobs, prosperity, growth and businesses. That's what we want. So if we, f if we continue the funding model, will we get what we want at the end? This is prosperity, economic activity. Now, I don't buy the argument that to have a smart economy, to have indigenous companies, to have a strong commercial uh, community, that we need a strong scientific community. I think if we can get it, with a strong scientific community. If the scientific community generates that, great. But there seems to be an idea that if we invest this money, we will generate a new Nokia, we'll generate a new Microsoft, we'll generate a new Google. Is there any appreciation of how unlikely it is to generate a Google or a Nokia or a Microsoft? History and context matter. History and context matter. And just as they matter in Finland for Nokia, matter in, in Santa Clara, in Silicon Valley, with the uh, public funding for, uh, uh, government funding for defense, it matters. So where are we coming from? We need to be aware of where we're coming from. Um, let, let's get real about this too. There will be cuts in the budget in this, in, this, uh, in this area. Of course there will. I think it would be wrong to impose cuts across the, um, the economy and to excuse funding for basic research. I think that would be wrong. Um, I don't think there's any, anything sacred about any sector of the community uh, or any sector of the economy that can opt out of this. We're in too much of a hole to, it's for there not to be cuts in this area. The extent to which there will be cuts, I think, is, is the question. Um, I think absolutely, in terms of balance on the funding, there, there should be more funding if there is funding for science and for, for academic research, there should be more for science. I mean, there is a comment that you know to do economic research, all you need are cigarettes and coffee, right? So I mean, there isn't the large um, fixed cost involved in funding for arts and humanities that there would be for science. So that balance must be there. I mean, everyone recognizes that. It's the extent to which it should be there. And the last thing I, I just want to say is that um, you know I asked what what the purpose, well. Quickly, that's what the purpose of a world class university. I wasn't trying to get at the idea that people would have to go away to study. What I was trying to get at is we want a world class university again to generate jobs, growth, businesses. That's where we want them. We don't want them or PhDs just for the sake of them. We can double number of PhDs in the morning, just give a PhD to everyone doing a master's degree. That doesn't make us more innovative. Um, the, the argument about MNCs or multinational corporations staying here, of course, it can be a surprise that high-tech multinational corporations want us to keep investing in science. I mean, we can't be surprised at that. But Jim O'Hara would want us to keep investing in, in IT. That's, that's not going to get the front page of, of any newspaper. Um, it's, it's almost as if we've paid the ransom and they keep coming back to kidnap us. And we keep paying the ransom. 
because if you don't, we'll kidnap you again. And then you keep paying the ransom because they'll kidnap you again. You can't stop. You can't get off this, this merry-go-round. You can't get off this cycle because we'll go. We're heading towards the door. They're, they've got their hand on the door. You better come up with the money or we're gone. Oh, quick, here, throw some money, quick. We don't have the money to throw anymore. Sorry, it's all gone. And finally, and, and briefly, can I call on Luca, a self-proclaimed tiger kidnapper? To, I'll, I'll just uh, get slightly more optimistic, pessimistic. <laughs> um, I guess the trouble with this is, you know, as a scientist, I'd like to see data. You know, I'd like to see data that can be predictive, and it's very hard to achieve in this area. So it's all of it is a bit frustrating. Um, I would, I would, I would. Abs I mean, I, I would take exception with some of the stuff Declan says. Obviously, the government might give money to small businesses, say, because they're going to be the ones who innovate and you know, create the jobs, and then we now have an employment sector. There's very little evidence that government subsidized businesses are useful, it seems to me. My reading is some of the statistics, right? In fact, the ones that the government subsidize often go down, right? And in other countries, the view is the government will fund basic research, and then the venture capital community and the private sector take up the, and innovate from there, right? Now, we're missing that bit. I don't quite know why we're missing that bit. So what scientists, I think, are delivering, and you, you did say we are, and that's good to hear, we're very well aware that, and, and, and James Callaghan would agree, the universities are very aware we must protect the IP, we must encourage its development. <coughs> What's missing is the next stage. That's not our fault. You know, that's not our fault. And I, as, I, as the point I made earlier was, anybody who's bright and good in science, countries would snap us up like that because we're valued in those countries. If we're not valued in our own country, we'll have to go somewhere else. That's the tragedy that will happen to this country. The brightest people that we have here will go. And secondly, we need to attract more people anyway. I mean, one of the triumphs of SFI was they've, they've now managed to attract outstanding people from overseas to come and do science here with us, which is a great achievement. They'll go, like, they'll be the first to go, of course, you know, and then us Irish will follow next. And that, that, that's what's going to happen. Let's not make any bones about it. That's not the country I want for my kids. That's, that's, the, that's the key point I would make. Now, there's two or three points that were made in the audience. Um, I think the point about us, we were overpaid for deficit. There's no two ways about that, us academics. So it's hand on heart, I'm overpaid by international norms. Secondly, I think the postdocs began to get overpaid because of SFI. I no, have no problem with a pay cut to save the non-pay part of the budget. The other question about uh, overqualification is a really important one. Whoever came up with the idea of doubling the number of PhDs needs to be taken outside and given a damn good thrashing. Um, that was without sense to me. They were looking at Finland or somewhere and they have all these PhDs without any thought for what, where those people might get work. Um, secondly, um, you know, Absolutely, there's inflation of qualifications. It's ridiculous. I, I mean, I just can't believe what's been happening in Ireland with regard to inflated people with their qualifications. There's a conspiracy there in some ways. You know, sectors want to get degrees, they get more pay then, for instance, you know? Or the universities need to increase the number of bums on seats, so they agree to it. There's all kinds of reasons why it's happening, and I'm dead against it. I think it's a big mistake. It's very hard to stop, but it's a big mistake. And then the other thing that struck me from the comments was, I hate this art science debate. It's absolutely useless if you're in a university to have that tension. If you want to be part of an outstanding university, we have to have outstanding in all the sectors. And, the, and if anybody was able to prove to me, and the evidence may be there, follow it now, that science benefited at the expense of the arts and humanities, I would speak out strongly against them. That's a tragedy for a university that the two should be juxtaposed like that. I want to be part of a university. And that means having both the arts and humanities and the sciences supported. It's more expensive to do science, of course. And, and the, our arts colleagues are very gracious in some ways, because in the international rankings in Trinity, our arts and humanities are very high up the rankings, higher than some of the sciences are. You might argue, shut down science, and you guys will go higher. You know? <laughs> um, so I hate that debate. I think it's very unhelpful to put Peter, you know, put, put us at odds like that. And the government would be absolutely uh, very disingenuous to try to do that, I think. Where I do see the debate is the, the odds, uh, or the, the, the conflict between putting money into small businesses versus basic research. That's a more robust comparison in terms of what counts as output and success. I, I have no trouble uh, criticizing that aspect of the debate. So I think uh, we must remember that we're all in this together, and that, that's, that's my sort of bottom line, I guess, that we must, as you were saying, Paul, fight this one together against the government with the view to the future and what sort of country we want Ireland to be. That's what this is about. And if the government gets this wrong, it'll threaten the future of our country for the next 20, 30 years. I'm definitely convinced of that. I'm afraid on that note we have to uh, finish because we are badly over time. I do think the, the run on time, though, is, is testament to the, uh, to the cogency of the arguments presented by the speakers uh, and to the uh, stimulating nature of the debate. So I'd like you to uh, join me in thanking the speakers.